The Byford Dolphin was a semi-submersible oil drilling rig operated by Dolphin Energy. It started operation in 1974 and was drilling for various companies in the North Sea off the coast of Norway. On November 5, 1983, a tragic incident took place on this drilling rig, causing it to be considered one of the most horrifying ocean accidents in history. This story covers some especially gruesome events. Listener discretion is advised. Saturation divers are professional deep-sea divers who descend to depths of up to 1,000 feet deep to service equipment on offshore oil rigs and undersea pipelines. Pay is very high for saturation divers, but it's intense work and can be dangerous. As a diver descends, the weight of the water around them applies pressure to every cell in their body. The pressure even compresses molecules of nitrogen, taken in by the lungs, which causes the nitrogen gas to dissolve into the bloodstream. Since the nitrogen is compressed, the body takes in more nitrogen than it would at the surface. The degree of pressure as one descends underwater can be measured in atmospheres. Two atmospheres is double the pressure on the Earth's surface, three atmospheres is triple, and so on. At three atmospheres, a diver's body contains three times the typical amount of nitrogen. If they come up too quickly, the nitrogen will instantly expand to its normal size, forming bubbles inside the diver's body, causing pain, difficulty breathing, or even death. This is called decompression sickness. That's why divers must slowly come up, a little bit at a time, so the nitrogen can safely expand and decompress. Nitrogen bubbles that form in the bloodstream can prevent the circulation of blood. The deeper you dive and the longer you stay underwater, the more nitrogen gets dissolved in your bloodstream. Eventually, a diver's body becomes saturated with dissolved nitrogen, which is how saturation divers got their name. If saturation divers use the same technique as recreational divers to safely decompress by slowly ascending with long pauses, it would take them days to reach the surface. Instead, saturation divers are shuttled to the surface in pressurized diving bells and then transferred into specialized decompression chambers. For every 100 feet that a saturation diver descends, they need to spend approximately one day in the chamber. In the chamber, they relax on cots, watch movies, and receive food through pressurized slots. The thing is, it's not economical for an oil company to pay saturation divers for a few hours of work and several days of rest. So instead of decompressing after each dive, saturation divers just stay at pressure. This is possible because once you've reached saturation level, your body can't absorb any more nitrogen no matter how long you stay under pressure. For up to 28 days, which is the industry maximum, saturation divers will commute to the depths in pressurized diving bells. During this stage, instead of entering a decompression chamber on the surface, the divers sleep inside of a hyperbaric chamber that maintains their bodies at the same pressure level as the deep water. The last week of any saturation diving job is reserved for slow and steady decompression before the divers are finally able to leave their cramped quarters and breathe fresh air again. It takes a whole crew to make a saturation diving operation work. Life support technicians ensure that the air mix in the hyperbaric chamber matches the air that the divers breathe underwater. The dive control team is in charge of operating the diving bell, which raises and lowers on a crane, and monitoring the divers as they work. There are also cooks that prepare and serve meals to the divers in their living chambers. Workers called tenders help unspool and retract the umbilical, which is the thick line of air supply tubes and communication wires that connects the divers to the surface. In the past, tenders were also responsible for docking the diving bell to the pressurized living chambers. Essentially, the divers are completely at the mercy of the crew. The Byford Dolphin was equipped with two pressurized living chambers. On November 5, 1983, 
two divers on the Byford Dolphin, Bjorn Bergersen and Trolls Helvik, were returning from a dive. Fellow divers, Edwin Coward and Roy Lucas, were already resting inside Living Chamber 2. Two diving tenders, William Crammond and Martin Saunders, were operating the diving bell for Bergersen and Helvik. William Crammond had just connected the diving bell to the living chambers and safely deposited Bjorn Bergersen and Trolls Helvik into living chamber 1. Chamber 1 was connected to the diving bell by a trunk. The diving bell and chambers were pressurized at 9 atmospheres in order to match the water in which the divers worked, meaning that all the divers had nine times the usual amount of nitrogen in their bodies than they normally would at the surface. Then things went horribly wrong. Under normal circumstances, the diving bell wouldn't be detached from the living chambers until the chamber doors were safely sealed shut. However, the diving bell detached before the chamber doors were closed, creating what's described as an explosive decompression. The air pressure inside the Byford Dolphin living chambers instantly went from 9 atmospheres to 1 atmosphere. The explosive rush of air out of the chamber sent the heavy diving bell flying, killing William Crammond and critically injuring his fellow tender, Martin Saunders. At the same time, the four divers inside the chambers were brutally killed. Three of the men, Edwin Coward, Roy Lucas, and Bjorn Bergerson, were essentially boiled from the inside when the nitrogen in their blood violently erupted into gas bubbles, instantly killing them. The fourth diver, Trolls Helvik, was standing in front of the partially open door to the living chamber when the pressure was released. His body was sucked out through an opening so narrow that it tore him open and ejected his internal organs onto the deck. Body parts were launched up to 30 feet away. The incident led to significant changes in commercial diving safety worldwide, including the formation of the North Sea Divers Alliance. The Alliance lobbies for the protection of North Sea divers. Today, every diving operation is required to make an extensive risk assessment and hazard analysis. There are redundancies built into every procedure to eliminate human error or faulty equipment. Some oil rigs are even equipped with special hyperbaric lifeboats that can transport saturation divers away from a hurricane or fire without having to bring them back to surface pressure first. Following the disaster, investigators claimed the improper seal on the diving bell was due to an error made by William Crammond. They alleged that he mistakenly depressurized the diving bell early while it was still connected to the chambers and the doors between were open. However, in 2008, after much lobbying from the North Sea Divers Alliance, the cause was found to have been an equipment malfunction clearing William Crammond of the blame. The Byford Dolphin was using a severely outdated diving system. It took decades for the Norwegian government to take responsibility for the accident and provide restitution to the families of the five men killed. It wasn't until 2009 that the Norwegian government paid undisclosed sums of money to the families of all six men involved in the 1983 accident including the injured Martin Saunders. Mm -hmm.